political arithmetic, or a discourse concerning the extent and value of lands, people, buildings, husbandry, manufacture, commerce, fishery, artisans, seamen, soldiers, public revenues, interest, taxes, superlucration, registries, banks, valuation of men, increasing of seamen, of militias, harbors, situation, shipping, power at sea, and sea, as the same relates to every country in general, but more particularly to the territories of his Majesty of Great Britain, and his neighbours of Holland, Zealand, and France. By Sir William Petty, late Fellow of the Royal Society. London, printed for Robert Clavel at the Peacock, and Hen. Mortlock at the Phoenix in St. Paul's Churchyard. 1690. Let this book called Political Arithmetic, which was long since writ by Sir William Petty, deceased, be printed, given at the court at Whitehall the seventh day of November, 1690, Nottingham, to the King's Most Excellent Majesty, S.I.R. While as every one meditates some fit offering for your Majesty, such as may best agree with your happy exaltation to this throne, I presume to offer what my father long since writ to show the weight and importance of the English crown. It was by him stilled political arithmetic, in as much as things of government, and of no less concern and extent than the glory of the prince, and the happiness and greatness of the people, are by the ordinary rules of arithmetic, brought into a sort of demonstration. He was allowed by all, to be the inventor of this method of instruction, where their perplexed and intricate ways of the world, are explained by a very mean pace of science, and had not the doctrines of this essay offended France. They had long since seen the light, and had found followers, as well as improvements before this time, to the advantage perhaps of mankind. But this has been reserved to the felicity of your majesty's reign, and to the expectation which the learned have therein. And if while in this, I do some honour to the memory of a good father, I can also pay service, and some testimony of my zeal and reverence to so great a king, it will be the utmost ambition of S.I.R. Your Majesty's most dutiful and most obedient subject. Shellborn.Preface For as much as men, who are in a decaying condition, or who have but an ill opinion of their own concernments, instead of being, as some think, the more industrious to resist the evils they apprehend, do contrariwise become their more languid and ineffectual in all their endeavours, neither caring to attempt or prosecute even the probable means of their relief upon this consideration, as a member of their commonwealth, next to knowing the precise truth in what condition the common interest stands, I would in all doubtful cases think the best, and consequently not despair, without strong and manifest reasons, carefully examining whatever tends to lessen my hopes of the public welfare. I have therefore thought fit to examine the following persuasions, which I find too current in the world, and too much to have affected the minds of some, to the prejudice of all, viz. that the rents of lands are generally fallen, that, therefore, and for many other reasons, the whole kingdom grows every day poorer and poorer, that formerly it abounded with gold, but now there is a great scarcity both of gold and silver, that there is no trade nor employment for the people, and yet that the land is underpeopled, that taxes have been many and great, that island and there 
plantations in America and other additions to the crown. Our Oberthen to England, that Scotland is of no advantage. That trade in general doth lamentably decay, that there. Hollanders are at our heels, in the race of naval power, there. French grow too fast upon both, and appear so rich and potent, that it is but their clemency that they do not devour their neighbours, and finally, that the church and state of England, are in the same danger with the trade of England. With many other dismal suggestions, which I had rather stifle than repeat. Tis true, the expense of foreign commodities hath of late been too great, much of our plate, had it remained. Money, would have better served trade, too many matters have been regulated by laws, which nature, long custom, and general consent, ought only to have governed, there. Slaughter and destruction of men by the late civil wars, and plague have been great, the fire at London, and disaster at Chatham, have begotten opinions in the vulgus of the world to our prejudice, the non-conformists increases. The people of Ireland think long of their settlement, there. English the apprehend themselves to be aliens, and are forced to seek a trade with foreigners, which they might as well maintain with their own relations in England. But, notwithstanding all this, the like whereof was always in all places, the buildings of London grow great and glorious. The American plantations employ four hundred sail of ships, actions in the East India Company are near double. The principal money, those who can give good security, may have money under the statute interest, materials for building, even oak and timber, are little the dearer, some cheaper for the rebuilding of London, the exchange seems as full of merchants as formerly, no more beggars in their streets, nor executed for thieves, than heretofore, their number of coaches, and splendor of equipage exceeding former times, the public theatres very magnificent, their king has a greater navy, and stronger guards than before, our calamities, the clergy rich, and the cathedrals in repair, much land has been improved, and the price of food so reasonable, as that men refuse to have it cheaper, by admitting of Irish cattle, and in brief, no man needs to, want that will take moderate pains, that some are poorer, than others, ever was and ever will be, and that many are, naturally querulous and envious, is an evil as old as their, world, these general observations, and that men eat, and drink, and laugh as they used to do, have encouraged me to try if I could also comfort others, being satisfied myself, that their interest and affairs of England are in no deplorable condition. The method I take to do this, is not yet very usual, for, instead of using only comparative and superlative words, and intellectual arguments, I have taken the course, as a specimen of the political arithmetic I have long aimed at, to express myself in terms of number, weight, or measure, to use only arguments of sense, and to consider only such causes, as have visible foundations in nature, leaving those that depend upon the mutable minds, opinions, appetites, and passions of particular men, to the consideration of others, really professing myself as unable to speak satisfactorily upon those grounds, if they may be called grounds, as to foretell the cast of a die, to play well at tennis, billiards, or bowls, without long practice, by virtue of the most elaborate conceptions that ever have been written de projectilibus and missilibus, or of the angles of incidence and reflection. Now the observations or positions expressed by number, weight, and measure, upon which I bottom the ensuing 
discourses, are either true, or not apparently false, and which, if they are not already true, certain, and evident, yet may be made so by the sovereign power, na mit certumist quad, certum redipotist, and if they are false, not so false as to destroy the argument they are brought for, but at worst are sufficient as suppositions to show the way to that no legia mat. And I have withal for the present confined myself to the ten principal conclusions hereafter particularly handled, which if they shall be judged material, and worthy of a better discussion, I hope all ingenious and candid persons will rectify the errors, defects, and imperfections, which probably may be found in any of the positions, upon which these ratiocinations were grounded. Nor would it misbecome authority itself, to clear the truth of those matters which private endeavors cannot reach to their principal conclusions of this treatise are chap i that a small country and few people may by their situation trade and policy be equivalent in wealth and strength to a far greater people and territory and particularly how conveniences for shipping and water carriage do most eminently and fundamentally conduce thereunto. Chap. 2. That some kind of taxes and public levies may rather increase than diminish the commonwealth. Chap. 3. That France cannot by reason of natural and perpetual impediments be more powerful at sea than the English or Hull. Landers. Chap. 4. That the people and territories of the King of England are naturally near as considerable for wealth and strength as those of France. Chap. V. That the impediments of England's greatness are but contingent and removable. Chap. V. That the power and wealth of England hath increased above this forty years. Chap. 7. That one tenth part of the whole expense of the King of England's subjects is sufficient to maintain one hundred thousand foot, thirty thousand horse, and forty thousand men at sea, and to defray all other charges of the government, both ordinary and extraordinary, if the same were regularly taxed and raised. Chap. 8. That there are spare hands enough among the King of England's subjects to earn two millions per annum, more than they now do, and there are employments ready, proper, and sufficient for that purpose. Chap. 9. That there is money sufficient to drive the trade of their nation. Chap. X. That the King of England's subjects have stock competent and convenient to drive the trade of the whole commercial world. Chap. I. That a small country and few people, by its situation, trade, and policy, may be equivalent in wealth and strength, to a far greater people and territory, and particularly that conveniences for shipping and water carriage, do most eminently and fundamentally conduce thereunto. This first principal conclusion by reason of its length, I consider in three parts, whereof the first is, that a small country and few people, may be equivalent in wealth and strength to a far greater people and territory. This part of the first principal conclusion needs little proof, for as much as one acre of land, may bear as much corn and feed as many cattle as twenty, by the difference of the soil, some parcel of ground is naturally so defensible, as that an hundred men being possessed thereof, can resist the invasion of five hundred, and bad land may be improved and made good, bog may by draining be made, meadow, heath land may, as in Flanders, be made to bear 
flax and clover grass, so as to advance in value from one to an hundred the same land being built upon, may centuple the rent which it yielded as pasture, one man is more nimble, or strong, and more patient of labor than another, one man by art may do as much work, as many without it, viz, one man with a milking grind as much corn, as twenty can pound in a mortar, one printer can make as many copies, as an hundred men can write by hand, one horse can carry upon wheels, as much as five upon their backs, and in a boat, or upon ice, as twenty. So that I say again, this first point of this general position needs little or no proof. But the second and more material part of this conclusion is, that this difference in land and people, arises principally from their situation, trade, and policy. To clear this, I shall compare Holland and Zealand with the Kingdom of France viz. Holland and Zealand do not contain above one million of English acres, whereas their Kingdom of France contains above eighty. Now the original and primitive difference holds pro portion as land to land, for it is hard to say, that when these places were first planted, whether an acre in France was better than the like quantity in Holland and Zealand. Nor is there any reason to suppose, but that therefore upon the first plantation, the number of planters was in proportion to the quantity of land, wherefore, if the people are not in the same proportion as the land, the same must be attributed to the situation of the land, and to the trade and policy of the people superstructed thereupon. The next thing to be shown is, that Holland and Zealand at this day, is not only an eightieth part as rich and strong as France, but that it hath advanced to one third or there about, which I think will appear upon the balance of their following particulars, viz. as to the wealth of France, a certain map of that kingdom, set forth anno 1647, represents it to be fifteen millions, whereof six did belong to the church, the author thereof, as I suppose, meaning the rents of the lands only and the author of the most judicious discourse of husbandry, supposed to be Sir Richard Weston, doth from reason and experience show, that lands in the Netherlands, by bearing flax, turnips, clover grass, mudder, and sea, will easily yield ten litres per acre, so as the territories of Holland and Zealand should by his account yield at least ten millions per annum. Yet I do not believe the same to be so much, nor France so little as above said, but rather, that one bears to the other as about seven, or eight to one. The people of Amsterdam, are one third of those in Paris, or London, which two cities differ not in people a twentieth, part from each other, as hath appeared by the bills of burials and christenings for each. But the value of the buildings in Amsterdam, may well be half that of Paris, by reason of their foundations, grafts, and bridges, which in Amsterdam are more numerous and chargeable than at Paris. Moreover their habitations of the poorest people in Holland and Zealand are twice or thrice as good as those of France, but their people of the one to the people of the other, being but as thirteen to one, the value of the housing must be as about five to one. The value of the shipping of Europe, being about two millions of tons, I suppose the English have five hundred thousand, the Dutch nine hundred thousand, the French an hundred thousand, the hamburgers, and the subjects of Denmark, Sweden, and the town of Danzig two hundred and fifty thousand, and Spain, Portugal, Italy, and C. two 
850,000, so is the shipping in our case of France to that of Holland and Zealand, is about 1 to 9, which reckoned as great and small, new and old, 1. With another at 8 litres per tonne, makes the worth to be as 8. Hundred thousand pounds to seven millions and two hundred thousand pounds. The Hollanders' capital in their East India Company is worth above three millions, where the French as yet have little or nothing. The value of the goods exported out of France into all parts are supposed quadruple to what is sent to England alone, and consequently in all about five millions, but what is exported out of Holland into England is worth three millions, and what is exported thence into all the world, besides, is sextuple to the same. The money is yearly raised by the King of France, as the same appears by the book intituled, The State of France. Dedicated to the King, printed anno 1669, and set forth several times by authority, is 82 million of French livers, which is about six and a half millions of pounds sterling, of which some the author says, that one fifth part was abated for non-values or insolvencies, so, as I suppose, not above five millions were effectually raised, but whereas some say, that the King of France raised eleven millions as the one five of their effects of France, I humbly affirm, that all the land and sea forces, all the buildings and entertainments, which we have heard by common fame, to have been set forth and made in any of these seven last years, needed not to have cost six millions sterling, wherefore, I suppose he hath not raised more, especially since there were one-fifth insolvencies, when the tax was at that pitch, but Holland and Zealand, paying sixty-seven of the one hundred, paid by all the United Provinces, and the city of Amsterdam paying twenty-seven of the said sixty-seven, it follows, that if Amsterdam hath paid four thousand litres, Flemish bdm, or about one million four hundred thousand litres per annum, or eight hundred thousand litres sterling, that all Holland and Zealand have paid two million one hundred thousand litres per annum. Now, the reasons why I think they pay so much are these, viz. 1. The author of the State of the Netherlands saith so. 2. Excise of Vittel at Amsterdam seems above half the original value of the same, viz. Ground corn pays twenty stivers the bushel, or sixty-three guilders there. Last, beer one thirteen stivers the barrel, housing one six of rent. Fruit of what it cost, other commodities one seven, one nine, one one hundred and twenty-two, salt. Ad libitum, all weighed goods pay besides the premises e. Vast sum. Now, if the expense of the people of Amsterdam at a medium and without excise were eight litres per annum, whereas in England tis seven litres, then if all the several imposts above named raise it five pound more, there being one hundred and sixty thousand souls in Amsterdam, the sum of eight hundred thousand litres sterling per. Annum will thereby be raised. 3. Though the expense of each head should be 13 litres per annum, tis well known that there be few in Amsterdam who do not earn much more than the said expense. 4. If Holland and Zealand pay p. an. 2,100,000 litres, then all the provinces together must pay about 3 million litres less than, which some per annum, perhaps is not sufficient to have, maintained the naval war with England, 72,000 land, forces, besides all other the ordinary charges of their, government, whereof the church is there a part, to conclude, 
It seems from the premises, that all France doth not raise above thrice as much from the public charge, as Holland and Zealand alone do. 5. Interest of money in France, is 7 litres. Percent. But in Holland scarce half so much. 6. The countries of Holland and Zealand, consisting as it were of islands guarded with the sea, shipping, and marshes, is defensible at one fourth of the charge, that a plain open country is, and where the feet of war may be, both winter and summer, whereas in the others, little can be done but in the summer only. 7. But above all the particulars hitherto considered, that of superlucration or chiefly to be taken in, for if a prince have never so many subjects, and his country be never so good, yet if either through sloth, or extravagant expenses, or oppression and injustice, whatever is gained shall be spent as fast as gotten, that state must be accounted poor. Wherefore let it be considered, how much or how many times? Rather, Holland and Zealand are now above what they were. One hundred years ago, which we must also do of France, now if France hath scarce doubled its wealth and power, and that the other have decupled theirs, I shall give the preference to the latter, even although the nine tenths increased by the one, should not exceed the one half gained by the other, because one has a store for nine years, the other but for one. To conclude, upon the whole it seems, that though France be in people to Holland and Zealand as thirteen to one, and in quantity of good land, as eighty to one, yet it is not thirteen times richer and stronger, much less eighty times, nor much above thrice, which was to be proved. Having thus dispatched the two first branches of the first principal conclusion, it follows, to show that this difference of improvement in wealth and strength, arises from the situation, trade, and policy of the places re respectively, and in particular from conveniences for shipping and water carriage. Many writing on this subject do so magnify the Hollanders as if they were more, and all other nations less than men, as to the matters of trade and policy, making them angels, and others fools, brutes, and sot, as to those particulars, whereas I take the foundation of their achieve meant to lie originally in the situation of the country whereby they do things inimitable by others, and have advantages whereof others are incapable. First, the soil of Holland and Zealand is lowland, rich and fertile, whereby it is able to feed many men, and so as that men may live near each other, for their mutual assistance in trade, I say, that a thousand acres, that can feed one thousand souls, is better than ten thousand acres of no more effect, for the following reasons, viz. 1. Suppose some great fabric were in building by a thousand men, shall not much more time be spared if they lived all upon a thousand acres, than if they were forced to live upon ten times as large a scope of land. 2. The charge of the cure of their souls, and their ministry would be far greater in one case than in the other. As also of mutual defense in case of invasion, and even of thieves and robbers, moreover the charge of the ad ministration of justice would be much easier, where witnesses and parties may be easily summoned, attendance less expensive, when men's actions would be better known, when wrongs and injuries could not be covered, as in thin peopled places they are. Lastly, those who live in solitary places, must be their own soldiers, divines, physicians, and lawyers, and must have their houses stored with necessary provisions, like a 
ship going upon a long voyage, to the great wast, and needless expense of such provisions. The value of this first convenience to the Dutch, I reckon or estimate to he out. 100,001. Per annum. Two light years. Holland is a level country, so as in any part. Thereof, a windmill may he set up, and he it sing moist. And vaporous, there is always wind stirring over it, by which advantage the labor of many thousand hands is saved. For as much as a mill made by one man in half a year, will do. As much labor, as four men for five years together. This advantage is greater or less, where employment or ease of labor is so, but in Holland tis eminently great, and there worth of this conveniency is near an hundred and fifty thousand pounds. Three light years. There is much more to be gained by manufacture than husbandry, and by merchandise than manufacture. But Holland and Zealand, being seated at the mouths of three long great rivers, and passing through rich countries, do keep all the inhabitants upon the sides of those rivers. Hut as husbandmen, whilst themselves are the manufactors of their commodities, and do dispense them into all parts of the world, making returns for the same, at what prices? Almost they please themselves, and in short, they keep their keys of trade of those countries, through which the said rivers pass, the value of this third conveniency, I suppose, to be two hundred thousand litres. For light years, in Holland and Zealand, there is scarce any place of work, or business one mile distant from a navigable water, and the charge of water carriage is generally but one fifteen, or part of land carriage, wherefore if there be as much trade there as in France, then the Hollanders can outsell the French fourteen fifteen of all the expense, of all travelling postage and carriage whatsoever, which even in England I take to be 300,001 p, m, where the very postage of letters, costs the people perhaps 50,000 litres per annum, though farmed at much less, and all are the labour of horses, and porters, at least six times as much, the value of this conveniency I estimate to be above three hundred thousand pounds per annum. 5. The defensibleness of the country, by reason of its situation in the sea upon islands, and in the marshes. Impassable ground diked and trenched, especially con. Sidering how that place is aimed at for its wealth, I say the charge of defending that country, is easier than if it were a plain champion at least 200,001 per annum. 6. Holland is so considerable for keeping ships in harbour with small expense of men, and ground tackle, that it saves per annum 200,000 litres, of what must be spent in France. Now if all these natural advantages do amount to above 1 million per annum profits, and that the trade of all Europe, nay of the whole world, with which our Europeans do trade, is not above forty-five millions p. An. And if of their value be one seven of the profit, it is plain that the whole land may command and govern the whole trade. 7. Those who have their situation thus towards the sea, and abound with fish at home, and having also their command of shipping, of by consequence the fishing trade, whereof that of herring alone, brings more yearly profit to the Hollanders than the trade of the West Indies to Spain, or of the East to themselves, as many have affirmed, being as the same savers and modis of above three millions per annum profit. 8. It is not to be doubted, but those who have their trade of shipping and fishing, will secure themselves of the trade of timber for ships, boats, masts, 
and cask, of hemp for cordage, sails, and nets, of salt, of iron, as also of pitch, tar, rosine, brimstone, oil, and tallow, as necessary. Appurtenances to shipping and fishing. 9. Those who predominate in shipping and fishing have more occasions than others to frequent all parts of the world, and to observe what is wanting or redundant every where, and what each people can do, and what they desire, and consequently to be the factors and carriers for the whole world of trade, upon which ground they bring all native commodities to be manufactured at home, and carry the same back, even to that country in which they grew. All which we see. 4. Do they not work the sugars of the West Indies? The timber and iron of the Baltic? The hemp of Russia? The lead, tin, and wool of England? The quicksilver? And silk of Italy? The yarns, and dyeing stuffs of Turkey? And see, to be short, in all the ancient states and empires, those who had the shipping, could the wealth, and if two per cent, in the price of commodities, be perhaps twenty per cent, in the gain, it is manifest that they who can in forty five millions, undersell others by one million, upon a comp of natural one, and intrinsic advantages only, may easily have their trade of the world without such angelical wits and judgments, as some attribute to the whole, landers. Having thus done with their situation, I come now to their trade. It is commonly seen, that each country flourisheth in their manufacture of its own native commodities, viz. England. For wool and manufacture, France for paper, Louis Clan for ironware. Portugal for confectures, Italy for silks, upon which principle it follows, that Holland and Zealand must flourish most in the trade of shipping, and so become carriers and factors of the whole world of trade. Now the advantages of the shipping trade are as followeth, this husbandmen, seamen, soldiers, artisans, and merchants are the very pillars of any commonwealth, all the other great professions, do rise out of the infirmities, and mis carriages of these, now the seaman is three of these four. For every seaman of industry and ingenuity, is not only a navigator, but a merchant, and also a soldier, not because he hath often occasion to fight, and handle arms, but because he is familiarized with hardship and hazards, x. tending to life and limbs, for training and drilling is a small part of soldiery, in respect of this last mentioned qualification, the one being quickly and presently learned, the other not without many years most painful experience. Wherefore to have the occasion of abounding in seamen, is a vast conveniency. Two. The husbandman of England earns but about fours per week, but the seamen have as good as twelves in wages, victuals, and as it were housing, with other accommodations. So as a seaman is in effect three husbandmen, wherefore there is little ploughing and sowing of corn in hoe, land and Zealand, or breeding of young cattle, but their land is improved by building houses, ships, engines, dikes, wharfs, gardens of pleasure, extraordinary flowers and fruits, for dairy and feeding of cattle, for ape, flax, mudder, and sea. The foundations of several advantageous manufactures. 3. Whereas the employment of other men is confined to their own country, that of seamen is free to the whole world, so as where trade may, as they call it, be dead here, or there, now and then, it is certain that somewhere or other in the world trade is always quick enough, and provisions are always plentiful, the benefit whereof, those 
who command the shipping in joy, and they only. 4. The great and ultimate effect of trade is not wealth at large, but particularly abundance of silver, gold, and jewels, which are not perishable, nor so mutable as other commodities, but are wealth at all times, and all places. Whereas abundance of wine, corn, fowls, flesh, and sea, are riches but hick and nunk, so is the raising of such commodities, and the following of such trade, which does store the country with gold, silver, jewels, and sea, is profitable before others, but the labor of seamen, and freight of ships, is always of the nature of an exported commodity, the overplus, whereof, above what is imported, brings home money, and sea. 5. Those who have the command of the sea trade, may work at easier freight with more profit, than others at greater, for as cloth must be cheaper made, when one cards, another spins, another weaves, another draws, and other dresses, another presses and packs, than when all the operations above mentioned, were clumsily performed by the same hand, so those who command the trade of shipping can build long slight ships for carrying masts, fur timber, boards, balks, and sea, and short ones for lead, iron, stones, and sea, one sort of vessels to trade at ports where they need, never lie aground, others where they must jump upon their sand twice every twelve hours, one sort of vessels, and way of manning in time of peace, and cheap gross, goods, another for war and precious commodities, one sort of vessels for the turbulent sea, another for inland waters and rivers, one sort of vessels, and rigging, where haste is requisite for the maiden head of a market, another where one five or one quarter part of the time makes no matter, one sort of masting and rigging for long voyages, another for coasting, one sort of vessels for fishing, another for trade, one sort for war for this or that country, another for burthen, only, some for oars, some for poles, some for sails, and some for draught by men or horses, some for the northern navigations amongst ice, and some for the south against worms, and sea, and this I take to be the chief of several reasons, why the Hollanders can go at less freight than their neighbors, viz, because they can afford a particular sort of vessels for each particular trade. I have shown how situation hath given them shipping, and how shipping hath given them in effect all other trade, and how foreign traffic must give them as much manufacture as they can manage themselves, and as for the overplus make the rest of the world but as workmen to their shops. It now remains to show the effects of their policy, superstructed upon these natural advantages, and not, as some think upon the excess of their understandings. I have omitted to mention the Hollanders were one hundred years since, a poor and oppressed people, living in a country naturally cold and unpleasant, and were with all persecuted for their heterodoxy in religion. From hence it necessarily follows, that this people must labor hard, and set all hands to work, rich and poor, young and old, must study the art of number, weight, and measure, must fare hard, provide for impotence, and for orphans, out of hope to make profit by their labors must punish the lazy by labor, and not by crippling them. I say, all these particulars, said to be the subtle excogit. Asians of the Hollanders, seem to me, but what could not, almost have been otherwise. Liberty of conscience, registry of conveyances, small customs, banks, lombards, and law merchant, rise all from the same spring, 
and tend to the same C, as for lowness. Of interest, it is also a necessary effect of all the premises. And not the fruit of their contrivance. Wherefore we shall only show in particular the efficacy of each, and first of liberty of conscience, but before I enter upon these, I shall mention a practice almost forgotten. Whether it refereth to trade or policy is not material. Which is, the Hollanders under masting, and sailing such of their shipping, as carry cheap and gross goods, and whose sail doth not depend much upon season. It is to be noted, that of two equal and like vessels, if one spreads 1,600 yards of like canvas, and the other 2,500, their speed is but as four to five, so as one brings home the same timber in four days, as the other will in five. Now if we consider that, although those ships be but four or five days under sail, that they are perhaps thirty upon the voyage, so as the one is but part longer upon the whole voyage than the other, though one fifth longer under sail. Now if masts, yards, rigging, cables, and anchors, do all depend upon their quantity and extent of the sails, and consequently hands. Also, it follows, that the one vessel, goes at one third less charge, losing but one thirtieth of the time, and of what depends thereupon. I now come to the first policy of the Dutch, viz. liberty of conscience, which I conceive they grant upon these grounds. But keeping up always a force to maintain their common peace, 1. They themselves broke with Spain, 2. Avoid the imposition of the clergy, 2. Dissenters of this kind, are for the most part, thinking, sober, and patient men. And such as believe that labor and industry is their duty towards God. How erroneous soever their opinions be. 3. These people believing the justice of God, and seeing the most licentious persons, to enjoy most of the world, and its best things, will never venture to be of the same religion and profession with voluptuaries, and men of extreme wealth and power, who they think have their portion in this world. 4. They cannot but know, that no man can believe what himself pleases, and to force men to say they believe what they do not, is vain, absurd, and without honor to God. 5. The Hollanders knowing themselves not to be an infallible church, and that others had the same scripture for guides as themselves, and with all the same interest to save their souls, did not think fit to make this matter their business, not more than to take bonds of the seamen they employ, not to cast away their own ships and lives. 6. The Hollanders observe that in France and Spain, especially the latter, the churchmen are about 100. For one, to what they use or need, the principal care of whom is to preserve uniformity and this they take to be a superfluous charge. 7. They observe where most endeavors have been used to keep uniformity, their heterodoxy hath most abounded. 8. They believe that if one quarter of the people were heterodox, and that if that whole quarter should by miracle be re-moved, that within a small time one quarter of the remainder would again become heterodox some way or other, it being natural for men to differ in opinion in matters above sense and reason, and for those who have less wealth, to think they have the more wit and understanding, especially of their things of God, which they think chiefly belong to the poor. 9. They think the case of the primitive Christians, as it is represented in the Acts of the Apostles, looks like that of the present dissenters, I mean externally, moreover it is 
to be observed that trade doth not, as some think, best flourish under popular governments, but rather that trade is most vigorously carried on, in every state and government, by the heterodox part of the same, and such as profess opinions different from what are publicly established, that is to say, in India where the Mahometan religion is author Ised, there the Banians are the most considerable merchants. In the Turkish Empire the Jews, and Christians. At Venice, Naples, Leghorn, Genoa, and Lisbon, Jews, and non-Papist. Merchant strangers, but to be short, in that part of Europe. Where the Roman Catholic religion now hath, or lately, hath had establishment, the three quarters of the whole trade, is in the hands of such as have separated from their church, that is to say, the inhabitants of England, Scotland, and Ireland, as also those of the United Provinces, with Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, together with the subjects of the German Protestant princes, and the Hans towns, do at this day possess three quarters of the trade of the world. And even in France itself, the Huguenots are proportionably far the greatest traders, nor is it to be denied but that in Ireland, where the said Roman religion is not authorized, the, the professors thereof have a great part of the trade. From whence it follows that trade is not fixed to any species of religion as such, but rather as before hath been said to the heterodox part of the whole the truth whereof appears also in all the particular towns of greatest trade in England, nor do I find reason to believe that the Roman Catholic seamen in the whole world are sufficient to man effectually a fleet equal to what the King of England now hath, but the non-papist seamen can do above thrice as much, wherefore he whom this latter party doth of affectionately own to be their head, cannot probably be wronged in his sea concernments by the other, from whence it follows, that for the advancement of trade, if that be a sufficient reason, indulgence must be granted in matters of opinion, though licentious actings as even in Holland, be restrained by force. The second policy or help to trade used by the Hollanders, is securing the titles to lands and houses, for, although lands and houses may be called terra firma and reasonableis, yet the title unto them is no more certain, than it pleases the lawyers and authority to make them. Wherefore the Hollanders do by registries, and other ways of assurance make the title as immovable as the lands, for, there can be no encouragement to industry, where there is no assurance of what shall be gotten by it, and where by fraud and corruption, one man may take away with ease and buy a trick, and in a moment what another has gotten by many years extreme labor and pains. There hath been much discourse, about introducing of registries into England, the lawyers for the most part object against it, alleging that titles of land in England are sufficiently secure already, wherefore remitting the con siderations of small and oblique reasons pro and contra, it were good that inquiry were made from the officers of several courts, to what some or value purchasers have been damnified for this last ten years, by such fraudulent con veyances as registries would have prevented, the tenth part whereof at a medium, is the annual loss which the people sustain for want of them, and then computation is to be made of the annual charge of registering such extraordinary conveyances, as would secure title of lands, now by comparing these two sums, the question so much agitated may be determined, though some think that though few are actually damnified yet that all are hindered by fear and deterred from dealing. Their third policy is their bank, the use whereof is to 
increase money, or rather to make a small sum equivalent in trade to a greater, for the effecting whereof these things are to be considered. 1. How much money will drive there? Trade of the nation. 2. How much current money there is actually in the nation? 3. How much money will serve to make all payments of under 50 litres or any other more con venient sum throughout the year? 4. For what sum there? Keepers of the bank are unquestionable security, if all these four particulars be well known, then it may also be known how much of the ready money above mentioned may safely and profitably be lodged in the bank, and to how much ready current money the said deposited money is equivalent. As for example, suppose a hundred thousand pounds will drive the trade of the nation, and suppose there be but sixty thousand pounds of ready money in the same. Suppose also that twenty thousand pounds will drive on and answer all payments made of under fifty litres. In this case forty of the sixty being put into the bank, will be equivalent to eighty, which eighty and twenty kept out of the bank do make up an hundred, that is to say, enough to drive there. Trade as was proposed, where note that the bank keepers must be responsible for double the sum entrusted with them, and must have power to levy upon the general, what they happen to lose unto particular men, upon which grounds, the bank may freely make use of the received forty thousand pounds, whereby the said sum with the like sum in credit makes eighty thousand pounds, and with the twenty reserved an hundred. I might here add many more particulars, but being there, e same as have already been noted by others, I shall conclude only with adding one observation which I take to be of consequence, viz. that the Hollanders do rid their hands of two trades, which are of greatest turmoil and danger, and yet of least profit, the first whereof is that of a common and private soldier, for such they can hire from England, Scot, land, and Germany, to venture their lives for six pence a day, whilst themselves safely and quietly follow such trades, whereby the meanest of them gain six times as much, and withal by this entertaining of strangers for soldiers, there country becomes more and more peopled, for as much as the children of such strangers, are Hollanders and take to trades, whilst new strangers are admitted ad infinitum. Besides these soldiers at convenient intervals, do at least as much work as is equivalent to what they spend, and consequently by this way of employing of strangers for soldiers they people the country and save their own persons from danger and misery, without any real expense. Effecting by this method, what others have in vain attempted, by laws for naturalizing of strangers, as if men could be charmed to transplant themselves from their own native, into a foreign country merely by words, and for the bare leave of being called by a new name. In Ireland laws of naturalization have had little effect, to bring in aliens, and tis no wonder, since English men will not go thither without they may have the pay of soldiers, or some other advantage amounting to maintenance. Having intimated the way by which the Hollanders do increase their people, one shall here digress to set down their way of computing the value of every head one with another, and that by the instance of people in England, viz. Suppose the people of England be six millions in number. That their expense at seven one. Per head be forty two millions. Suppose also that the rent of the lands be eight millions. And the profit of all the personal estate be eight millions. More, it must needs follow, that the labour of their people must have supplied the remaining twenty six. 
millions, the which multiplied by twenty, the mass of mankind being worth twenty years' purchase as well as land, makes five hundred and twenty millions, as the value two of the whole people, which number divided by six millions, makes above eighty liters sterling, to be valued of each head of man, woman, and child, and of adult persons twice as much, from whence we may learn to compute the loss we have sustained by the plague, by the slaughter of men in war, and by the sending them abroad into the service of foreign princes. Their other trade of which the Hollanders have rid their hands, is the old patriarchal trade of being cowkeepers, and in a great measure of that which concerns plying and sowing of corn, having put that employment upon the Danes and Polanders, from whom they have their young cattle and corn. Now here we may take notice that as trades and curious arts increase, so the trade of husbandry will decrease, or else the wages of husbandmen must rise, and consequently the rents of lands must fall. For proof whereof I dare affirm, that if all the husband men of England, who now earn but eight d a day or thereabouts, could become tradesmen and earn sixteen d a day, which is no great wage is 2s, and 2s, 6d, being usually given, that then, it would be the advantage of England to throw up their husbandry, and to make no use of their lands, but for grass horses, milch cows, gardens, and orchards, and see, which, if it be so, and if trade and manufacture have increased in England, that is to say, if a greater part of the people apply themselves to those faculties, than they did heretofore. And if the price of corn be no greater now, than when husbandmen were more numerous, and tradesmen fewer, it follows from that single reason, though others may be added, that the rents of land must fall, as for example, suppose the price of wheat E5s or sixty pence the bushel. Now if the rent of the land whereon it grows, be the third sheaf, then of the sixed, twenty d, is for the land, and forty d, for the husbandman, but if the husbandman's wages, should rise one eighth part, or from eight d, to nine d, per diem, then there husbandman's share in the bushel of wheat, rises from 40 d, to 45 d, and consequently the rent of the land must fall, from 20 d, to 15 d, for we suppose the price of the wheat, still remains the same, especially since we cannot raise it, for if we did attempt it, corn would be brought into us, as into Holland from foreign parts, where the state of husbandry was not changed. And thus I have done with the first principal conclusion, that, a small slash territory, and even a few people, now by secure, shun, trade, and polity, be made equivalent to a greater, and, that convenience for shipping, and water carriage, do most, eminently and fundamentally conduce thereunto. Chap. 2 that some kind of taxes and public levies, may rather, increase than diminish the wealth of the kingdom. If the money or other effects, levied from the people by, way of tax, were destroyed and annihilated, then tis, clear, that such levies would diminish the commonwealth. Or if the same were exported out of the kingdom without, any return at all, then the case would be also the same or, worse, but if what is levied as aforesaid, be only transferred from one hand to another, then we are only to consider whether the said money or commodities are taken from an improving hand, and given to an ill husband, or vice versa, as for example, suppose that money by way of tax be taken from one who spendeth the same in superfluous 
eating and drinking, and deliver to another who am. Ployth the same, in improving of land, in fishing, in working of mines, in manufacture, and see. It is manifest, that such tax is an advantage to the state whereof the said different persons are members, nay, if money be taken from him, who spendeth the same as aforesaid upon eating and drinking, or any other perishing commodity, and there same transferred to one that bestoweth it on clothes, I say that even in this case, the commonwealth hath some little advantage, because clothes do not altogether perish so soon as meats and drinks, but if the same be spent in furniture of houses, the advantage is yet a little more, if in building of houses, yet more, if in improving of lands, working of mines, fishing, and sea, yet more, but most of all, in bringing gold and silver into the country, because those things are not only not perishable, but are esteemed for wealth at all times, and everywhere, whereas other commodities which are perishable, or whose value depends upon the fashion, or which are contingently scarce and plentiful, are wealth, but prohic and nunc, as shall be elsewhere said. In the next place if the people of any country, who have not already a full employment, should be enjoined or taxed to work upon such commodities as are imported from abroad. I say, that such a tax, also doth improve the commonwealth. Moreover, if persons who live by begging, cheating, stealing, gaming, borrowing without intention of restoring, who by those ways do get from the credulous and careless, more than is sufficient for the subsistence of such persons. I say, that although the state should have no present employment for such persons, and consequently should be forced to bear the whole charge of their livelihood, yet it were more for the public profit to give all such persons a regular and competent allowance by public tax than to suffer them to spend extravagantly, at the only charge of careless, credulous, and good natured people, and to expose the commonwealth to the loss of so many able men, whose lives are taken away, for the crimes which ill discipline doth occasion. On the contrary, if the stocks of laborious and ingenious men, who are not only beautifying the country where they live by elegant diet, apparel, furniture, rousing, pleasant gardens, orchards, and public edifices, and sea, but are also increasing the gold, silver, and jewels of the country by trade and arms, I say, if the stock of these men should be diminished by a tax, and transferred to such as do nothing at all, but eat and drink, sing, play, and dance, nay to such as study the metaphysics, or other needless speculation, or else employ themselves in any other way, which produce no material thing, or things of real use and value in the com. Mun wealth, in this case, the wealth of the public will be diminished, otherwise than as such exercises, are recreations, and refreshments of the mind, and which being moderately used, do qualify and dispose men to what in itself is more considerable. Wherefore upon the whole matter, to know whether a tax will do good or harm, the state of the people, and their employments, must be well known, that is to say, what part of the people are unfit for labor by their infancy or impotency, and also what part are exempt from the same, by reason of their wealth, function, or dignities, or by reason of their charge and employments, otherwise, than in governing, directing and preserving those, who are appointed to labor and arts. 2. In the next place computation must be made, what part of those who are fit for labor and arts as aforesaid, 
are able to perform the work of the nation in its present state and measure. 3. It is to be considered, whether the remainder can may call or any part of those commodities, which are imported from abroad, which of them, and how much in particular, the remainder of which sort of people, if any, b, may safely and without possible prejudice to the com. Mun wealth, be employed in arts and exercises of pleasure and ornament, the greatest whereof is the improvement of natural knowledge. Having thus in general illustrated this point, which I think needs no other proof but illustration, I come next to intimate that no part of Europe hath paid so much by way of tax and public contribution as Holland and Zealand for this last one hundred years, and yet no country hath in the same time increased their wealth comparably to them, and it is manifest they have followed the general considerations above mentioned, for they tax meats and drinks most heavily of all, to restrain the excessive expense of those things, which twenty-four hours doth, as to the use of man, wholly annihilate, and they are more favourable to commodities of greater duration. Nor do they tax according to what men gain, but in extraordinary cases, but always according to what men spend, and most of all, according to what they spend, needlessly, and without prospect of return, upon which grounds, their customs upon goods imported and exported, are generally low, as if they intended by them, only to keep an account of their foreign trade, and to retaliate upon their neighbour states, the prejudice is done them, by their prohibitions and impositions. It is further to be observed, that since the year 1636, their taxes and public levies made in England, Scotland, and Ireland, have been prodigiously greater than at any time heretofore, and yet the said kingdoms have increased in their wealth and strength, for these last forty years, as shall hereafter be shown. It is said that the King of France, at present doth levy the fifth part of his people's wealth, and yet great ostim dashin is made of the present riches and strength of that kingdom. Now great care must be had in distinguishing between the wealth of the people, and that of an absolute monarch, who taketh from the people, where, when, and in what proportion he pleaseth. Moreover, the subjects of two monarchs may be equally rich, and yet one monarch may be double as rich as the other, viz. if one take their tenth part of the people's substance to his own dispose, and the other but the twentieth, nay the monarch of a poorer people, may appear more splendid and glorious, than that of a richer, which perhaps may be somewhat the case of France, as hereafter shall be examined, as an instance and application of what hath been said, I conceive that in Ireland, wherein are about one thousand two hundred thousand people, and near three hundred thousand smokes or hearths, it were more tolerable for the people, and more profitable for the king, that each head pay two's worth of flax, than that each smoke should pay two s in silver, and that for the following reasons. 1. Ireland being underpeopled, and land, and cattle, being very cheap, the being everywhere store of fish, and fowl, the ground yielding excellent roots, and pa, particularly that bread like root potatoes, and with all they, being able to perform their husbandry, with such harness, and tackling, as each man can make with his own hands, and living in such houses as almost every man can build, and every housewife being a spinner and dyer of wool, and yarn, they can live and subsist after their present fashion, without the use of gold or silver money, and can supply themselves with the necessaries above named, without labouring two hours per diem, 
now it hath been found, that, by reason of insolvencies arising, rather from the uselessness, than want of money among these poor people, that from three hundred thousand hearths, which should have yielded thirty thou sand pound per annum, not fifteen thousand pound of money, could be levied, whereas it is easily imagined, that four or five people dwelling in that cottage, which hath but one smoke, could easily have planted a ground plot of about forty foot square with flax, or the fifty part of an acre, for so much ground will bear eight or ten shillings worth of that commodity, and the rent of so much ground, in few places, amounts to a penny per annum. Nor is there any skill requisite to this practice, wherewith the country is not already familiar. Now as for a market for the flax, there is imported into Holland itself, over and above what that country produces, as much flax, as is there sold for b. Between eight score and two hundred thousand pound, and into England and Ireland is imported as much linen cloth, made of flax, and the spent, as is worth above half a million of money as shall hereafter be shown. Wherefore having shown, that silver money is useless to the poor people of Ireland, that half their half money could not be raised by reason thereof, that the people are not a fifth part employed, that the people and land of Ireland are competently qualified for flax, that one penny worth of land will produce ten shillings worth of the same, and that there is market enough and enough, for above an hundred thousand pounds worth, I conceive my proposition sufficiently proved, at least to set forwards and promote a practice, which both the present law and interest of the country doth require, especially, since if all the flax so produced should yield nothing, yet there is nothing lost the same time having been worse spent before. Upon the same grounds, the like tax of twos per head may be raised with the like advantage upon the people of England, which will amount to six hundred thousand pound per annum, to be paid in flax, manufactured, into all the sorts of linens, threads, tapes, and laces, which we now receive from France, Flanders, Holland, and Germany. The value whereof doth far exceed the sum last mentioned, as hath appeared by the examination of particulars. It is observed by clothiers, and others, who employ great numbers of poor people, that when corn is extremely plen, tiffle, that the labor of the poor is proportionably dear and scarce to be had at all, so licentious are they who labor only to eat, or rather to drink, wherefore when so many acres sown with corn, as do usually produce a sufficient store for the nation, shall produce perhaps double to what is expected or necessary, it seems not unreasonable that this common blessing of God should be applied to the common good of all people represented by their sovereign, much rather than the same should be abused, by the vile and brutish part of mankind, to the prejudice of the com in wealth, and consequently, that such surplusage of corn, should be sent to public storehouses, from thence, to be disposed of, to the best advantage of the public. Now if the corn spent in England, at five shillings per bushel wheat, and two shillings six pence barley, be worth ten millions communi bursanis, it follows that in years of great plenty, when the said grains are one third part cheaper, that a vast advantage might accrue to the common wealth, which now is spent in overfeeding of the people, in quantity or quality, and so in disposing them to their usual labor. The like may be said of sugar, tobacco, and pepper, which custom hath now made necessary to all sorts of people, and which the overplanting of them 
hath made. Unreasonably cheap, I say it is not absurd, that the public should be advantaged by this extraordinary plenty. That an excise should be laid upon currents also, is not unreasonable, not only for this, but for other reasons also. The way of the present militia or trained bands, is a gentle tax upon the country, because it is only a few days labor in the year, of a few men in respect of the whole, using their own goods, that is their own arms. Now if there be three millions of males in England, there be above two hundred thousand of them, who are between the age of sixteen and thirty, unmarried persons, and who live by their labor and service, for of so many or thereabouts. The present militia consists. Now if an hundred and five thousand of these were armed, and drand, as foot, and fifty thousand as horse, horse being of special advantage in islands, the said forces at land, with thirty thousand men at sea, would, by God's ordinary blessing, defend this nation, being an island, against any force in view, but the charge of arming, disciplining, and rendezvousing all these men, twice, or thrice a year, would be a very gentle tax, levied, by the people themselves, and paid to themselves. Moreover, if out of the said number part were selected, of such as, are more than ordinarily fit and disposed for war, and to, be exercised, and rendezvoused fourteen or fifteen times, per annum, the charge thereof being but a fortnight's pay, in the year, would be also a very gentle tax. Lastly, if out of this last mentioned number, one third again, should be selected, making about twelve thousand foot, and near six thousand horse, to be exercised, and ren, disvers forty days in the year, I say that the charge of, all these three militias, allowing the latter six weeks paper, annum, would not cost above one hundred and twenty, thousand pound per annum, which I take to be an easy, burthen, for so great a benefit, for as much as the present navy of England requires, thirty-six thousand men to man it, and for that the English, trade of shipping, requires about forty-eight thousand men, to manage it also, it follows, that to perform both well, there, ought to be about seventy-two thousand men, and not eighty, four thousand, competently qualified for these services. For want whereof we see, that it is a long while, before a Royal Navy can be manned, which till it be, is of no effectual use, but lies at charge. And we see likewise upon these occasions, that merchants are put to great straits and inconveniences, and do pay excessive rates for the carrying on their trade. Now, if twenty four thousand able Bodied tradesmen, were by six thousand of them per annum, brought up and fitted for sea service, and for their encouragement allowed twenties per annum for every year. They had been at sea, even when they stay at home, not exceeding six litres. For those, who have served six years or upward, it follows, that about seventy-two thousand litres at the medium of three one, per man, would salariate the whole number of twenty-four thousand. And so, for as much as half the seamen, which manage their merchants' trade, are supposed to be always in harbour, and are about twenty-four thousand men, together with the said half of the auxiliaries last mentioned, would upon all emergencies, man out the whole Royal Navy with thirty-six thousand, and leaving to the merchants twelve thousand of the abler auxiliaries, to perform their business in harbour, till others come home from sea, and thus thirty-six thousand, twenty-four thousand, and twelve thousand, make the seventy, two thousand above mentioned, I say that more than this, sum of seventy-two thousand litres, 
is fruitlessly spent, and overpaid by the merchants, whensoever a great fleet is to be fitted out. Now these whom I call auxiliary seamen, are such as have another trade besides, wherewith to maintain themselves. When they are not employed at sea, and the charge of maintaining them, though seventy-two thousand litres per annum, I take to be little or nothing, for the reasons above mentioned, and consequently an easy tax to the people, because levied by and paid to themselves. As we propounded that Ireland should be taxed with flax, and England by linen, and other manufacture of the same, I conceive that Scotland also might be taxed as much to be paid in herrings, as Ireland in flax, now the three taxes, viz., of flax, linen, and herrings, and their maintenance of the triple militia, and of the auxiliary seamen above mentioned, do all five of them together amount to one million of money, the raising whereof is not a million spent, but gain unto the commonwealth, unless it can be made appear, that by reason of all, or any of them, the exportation of woolen manufactures, lead, and tin, are lessened, or of such commodities, as our own East and West India trade do produce, for as much as I conceive, that their exportation of these last mentioned commodities, is the touchstone whereby the wealth of England is tried, and their pulse whereby the health of the kingdom may be discerned. Chap. 3. That France cannot by reason of natural, and perpetual, impediments, be more powerful at sea, than the English. Or Hollanders now are, or may be. Power at sea consists chiefly of men, able to fight at sea. And that in such shipping, as is most proper for their seas wherein they serve, and those are in these northern seas, ships from between 300 to 1,000. 300 tons, and of those such as draw much water, and have a deep latch in the sea, in order to keep a good wind, and not to fall to leeward, a matter of vast advantage. In sea service, wherefore it is to be examined, 1. Whether the King of France hath ports in the northern seas, where he hath most occasion for his fleets of war, in any contests, with England, able to receive the vessels above mentioned, in all weathers, both in winter and summer season, 4. If the King of France, would bring to see an equal number, of fighting men, with the English and Hollanders, in small, floaty leeward vessels, he would certainly be of the weaker, side. For a vessel of 1,000 tons manned with 500 men, fighting with 5 vessels of 200 tons, each manned with 100 men apiece, shall in common, reason have the better offensively, and defensively, for as much, as the great ship can carry such ordnance, as can reach there, small ones at a far greater distance, than those can reach, or, at least hurt the other, and can batter, and sink at a distance, when small ones can scarce pierce, moreover it is more difficult for men out of a small, vessel, to enter a tall ship, than for men from a higher place, to leap down into a lower, nor is small shot so effectual upon a tall ship, as vice versa. And as for vessels drawing much water, and consequently keeping a good wind, they can take or leave leeward vessels at pleasure, and secure themselves from being boarded by them. Moreover, the windward ship has a fair on mark at a leeward ship than vice versa, and can place her shot, upon such parts of the leeward vessel, as upon the next, tack will be under water. Now then the king of France, having no ports able to, receive large windward vessels, between Dunkirk and, Nushant, what other ships he can bring into those seas, will not be considerable, 
as for the wide ocean, which his harbors of Brest, and Charenty, do look into, it affordeth him no advantage upon an enemy, the being so great a latitude of engaging or not, even when the parties are in sight of each other. Wherefore, although the King of France were immensely rich, and could build what ships he pleased, both for number and quality, yet if he have not ports to receive, and shelter, that sort and size of shipping, which is fit for his purpose, the said riches will in this case be fruitless, and a mere expense without any return, or profit. Some will say that other nations cannot build so good ships as the English. I do indeed hope they cannot, but because it seems too possible, that they may sooner or later, by practice and experience, I shall not make use of that argument, having bound myself to show, that the impediments of France, as to this purpose, are natural, and perpetual. Ships, and guns, do not fight of themselves, but men who act and manage them, wherefore it is more material to show, that the king of France, neither hath, nor can have men sufficient, to man a fleet, of equal strength to that of the king of England, viz. The king of England's navy, consists of about seventy thousand tons of shipping, which requires thirty-six thousand men to man it, these men being supposed to be divided into eight parts, I conceive that one eighth part, must be persons of great experience, and reputation, in sea service, another eighth part must be such as have used the sea seven years. I and upwards, half of them, or parts more, must be such, as have used the sea above a twelve month, viz, two, three, four, five, or six years, allowing but one quarter of the whole, compliments, to be such as never were at sea at all, or at, most but one voyage, or upon one expedition, so that a day, medium I reckon, that the whole fleet must be men of three or four years growth, one with another. Fournier, a late judicious writer, making it his business to persuade their world, how considerable the King of France was, or might be at sea, in the ninety-second and ninety-third pages of his hydrography, saith, that there was one place in Brittany which had furnished the king with one thousand four hundred seamen, and that perhaps the whole sea coast of France, might have furnished him with fifteen times as many, now supposing his whole allegation were true, yet the said number amounts but to twenty-one thousand, all which, if the whole trade of shipping in France were quite and clean abandoned, would not buy above a third, man out. A fleet equivalent, to that of the King of England, and if the trade were but barely kept alive, there would not be one third part men enough, to man the said fleet. But if the shipping trade of France, be not above a quarter, as great as that of England, and that one third part, of the same, namely the fishing trade to the banks of Newfoundland, is not peculiar, nor fixed to the French, then. I say that if the King of England, having power to press men, cannot under two or three months' time man his fleet, then the King of France, with less than a quarter of the same help, can never do it at all, for in France, as shall elsewhere be shown, there are not above 150,000 ton of trading vessels, and consequently not above 15,000 seamen, reckoning a man to every 10 ton, as it has been shown that the King of France, cannot at present men such a fleet, as is above described, we come next to show that he never can, being under natural, and perpetual impediments, viz. 1. If there be but fifteen thousand sea men in all France, 
to manage its trade, it is not to be supposed that the said trade should be extinguished, nor that it should spare above five of the said fifteen thousand towards manning the fleet which requires thirty five thousand. Now the deficient thirty thousand must be supplied, one of these four ways, either, first by taking in landmen, of which sort there must not be above ten thousand, since there seamen will never be contented, without being the major part, nor do they heartily wish well to landmen at all, or rejoice even at those successes, of which the landmen can claim any share, thinking it hard that themselves, who are bred to miserable, painful, and dangerous employments, and yet profitable to the commonwealth, should at a time when booty and purchase is to be gotten, be clogged or hindered by any conjunction with landmen, or forced to admit those to an equal share with themselves. 2. Their seamen which we suppose twenty thousand, must be had. That is hired from other nations, which cannot be without tempting them with so much wages, as exceeds what is given by merchants, and with all to counterpoise the danger of being hanged by their own prince, and allowed no quarter. If they are taken, the trouble of conveying themselves away, when restraints and prohibitions are upon them, and also the infamy of having been apostates to their own country, and cause, I say their wages must be more than double, too. What their own prince gives them, and their assurance must be very great, that they shall not be at long run abused, or slighted by those who employed them, as hating their traitor, although they love the treason, I say moreover, that those who will be thus tempted away, must be of their basest, and lewdest sort of seamen, and such as have not enough of honour and conscience, to qualify them for any trust, or gallant performance. 3. Another way to increase seamen, is to put great numbers of landmen upon ships of war, in order to their being seamen, but this course cannot be effectual, not only for the above-mentioned antipathy between landmen and seamen, but also, because it is seen, that men at sea do not apply themselves to labour and practice, without more necessity than happens in over men shipping. For where there are fifty men in a vessel, that ten can sufficiently navigate, the supernumerary forty will improve little, but where there shall be of ten but one or two supernumeraries, the necessity will often call upon every man to set his hand to the work, which must be well done at the burial of their own lives. Moreover, seamen shifting vessels almost every six or twelve months do sometimes sail in small barks, sometimes in middling ships, and sometimes in great vessels of defence, sometimes in lighters, sometimes in hoys, sometimes in catches, sometimes in three-masted ships, sometimes they go to their southward, sometimes to the northward, sometimes the coast, sometimes they cross the ocean, by all which variety of service, they do in time complete themselves, in every part and circumstance of their faculty, whereas those who go out for a summer, in a man of war, have not that variety of practice, nor a direct necessity of doing anything at all. Besides it is three or four years at a medium, wherein a seaman must be made, neither can there be less than three seamen, to make a fourth of a landman, consequently there. Fifteen thousand seamen of France, can increase but five thousand seamen in three or four years, and unless there dread should increase with their seamen in proportion, their king must be forced to bear the charge of this improvement, out of the public stock, which is intolerable, so as the question which now remains, is, whether the shipping trade, 
of France is like to increase? Upon which account it is to be considered, 1. That France is sufficiently stored, with all kind of necessaries within itself, as with corn, cattle, wine, salt, linen cloth, paper, silk, fruits, and sea, so as they need little shipping, to import more commodities of weight, or bulk, neither is there anything of bulk exported out of France, but wines, and salt, the weight whereof is under 100,000 ton per annum, yielding not employ, meant to above 25,000 ton of shipping, and these are for the most part Dutch and English, who are not only already in possession of the said trade, but also are better fitted to maintain it, than the French are, or perhaps ever can be, and that for the following reasons, viz. 1. Because the French cannot victual so cheap as the English, and Dutch, nor sail with so few hands. 2. The French, for want of good coasts and harbours, cannot keep their ships in port, under double the charge that the English and Hollanders can. 3. By reason of paucity, and distance of their ports, 1. From another, their seamen and tradesmen relating to shipping, cannot correspond with, and assist one another. So easily, cheaply, and advantageously, as in other places. Wherefore if their shipping trade, is not likely to increase within themselves, and much less to increase, by their beating out the English, and Hollanders, from being the carriers of the world, it follows, that their seamen will not be increased by the increase of their said trade, wherefore, and for that, they are not like to be increased, by any of the several ways above specified, and for that their ports are not fit to receive ships of burthen, and quality, fit for their purpose, and that by reason of the less fitness of their ports, than that of their neighbours, I conceive, that what was propounded hath been competently proved. The aforenamed Fournier, in the 92nd and 93rd pages of his Hydrography, hath laboured to prove the contrary of all this, unto which I refer the reader, not thinking his arguments of any weight at all, in their present case, nor indeed doth he make his comparisons with the English or Hollanders, but with the Spaniards, who, nor the Grand Seigneur, the latter of whom hath greater advantages to be powerful at sea than the King of France could ever attain to any illustrious greatness in naval power. Having often attempted, but never succeeded in the same. Nor is it easy to believe, that the King of England should, for so many years, have continued his title to the sovereignty of the narrow seas, against his neighbours, ambitious enough to have gotten it from him, had not their impediments been natural and perpetual, and such, as we say, do obstruct there. King of France. Chap. 4. That the people and territories of the King of England, are naturally near as considerable for wealth and strength, as those of France. The author of the State of England, among the many useful truths, and observations he hath set down, delivers the proportion, between the territories of England and France, to be as thirty to eighty-two, the which if it be true, then England, Scotland, and Ireland, with the islands unto them, belonging, will, taken all together, be near as big as France. So I ought to take all advantages for proving the paradox in hand, yet I had rather grant that England, Scotland, and Ireland, with the islands before mentioned, together with the planted parts of Newfoundland, New England, New Nether Land, Virginia, Maryland, Carolina, Jamaica, Bermudas, Barbados, and all the rest of the Caribbean islands, with 
what the king hath in Asia and Africa, do not contain so much territory as France, and what planted land the king of France hath also in America. And if any man will be heterodox in behalf of the French interest, I would be contented against my knowledge and judgment, to allow the king of France's territories, to be a seventh, sixth, or even a fifth greater, than those of the king of England. Believing that both princes have more land, than they do employ to its utmost use. And here I beg leave, among the several matters which I intend for serious, to interpose a jocular, and perhaps ridiculous digression, and which I indeed desire men to look upon, rather as a dream or as very, than a rational propos. Sition, the which is, that if all the movables and people of Ireland, and of the highlands of Scotland, were transported into the rest of Great Britain, that then the king and his subjects, would thereby become more rich and strong, both offensively and defensively, than now they are. Tis true, I have heard many wise men say, when they were bewailing the vast losses of the English, in preventing and suppressing rebellions, in Ireland, and considering how little profit hath returned, either to the king or subjects of England, for their five hundred years doing and suffering. In that country, I say, I have heard wise men, in such their melancholies, wish, that, the people of Ireland being saved, Ireland were sunk under water, now it troubles me, that the distemper of my own mind in this point, carries me to dream, that the benefit of those wishes, may practically be obtained, without sinking that vast mountainous island under water, which I take to be somewhat difficult, for although Dutch engineers may drain its bogs, yet I know no artists that could sink its mountains, if ingenious and learned men, among whom I reckon Sir Thomas More, and Descartes, have disputed, that we who think ourselves awake, are or may be really in a dream, and since the greatest absurdities of dreams, are but a preposterous and tumultuary contexture of realities, I will crave the umbrage of these great men, last named, to say something for this wild conception, with submission to the better judgment of all those that can prove themselves awake. If there were but one man living in England, then their benefit of the whole territory could be but the livelihood of that one man, but if another man were added, the rent or benefit of the same would be double, if two, triple, and so forward until so many men were planted in it, as the whole territory could afford food unto, for if a man would know what any land is worth, the true and natural question must be, how many men will it feed? How many men are there to be fed? But to speak more practically, land of the same quantity and quality in England, is generally worth four or five times as much as in Ireland, and but one quarter, or third of what it is worth in Holland, because England is four or five times better peopled than Ireland, and but a quarter so well as Holland, and moreover, where the rent of land is advanced by reason of multitude of people, there there number of years purchase, for which the inheritance may be sold, is also advanced, though perhaps not in the very same proportion, for twenties per annum in Ireland, may be worth but eight one, and in England where titles are very sure, above two hundred and one, in Holland above thirty litres. I suppose, that in Ireland and the Highlands in Scotland, there may be about one million and eight hundred thousand people, or about a fifth part of what is in all the three king doms, wherefore the first question will be, whether England, Wales, and the lowlands of Scotland, cannot afford food, 
that is to say, corn, fish, flesh, and fowl, to a fifth part. More people, than are at the present planted upon it, with the same labor that the said fifth part do now take where they are? For if so, then what is propounded is naturally possible. 2. It is to be inquired, what the value of the immovables, which upon such removal must be left behind, are worth? For if they be worth less than the advancement of the price of land in England will amount unto, then their proposal is to be considered. 3. If the relic lands and the immovables left behind upon them may be sold for money, or if no other nation shall dare meddle with them without paying well for them, and if the nation who shall be admitted shall be less able to prejudice and annoy their transplantees into England than before, then I conceive that the whole proposal will be a pleasant and a profitable dream indeed. As to the first point, whether England and the lowlands of Scotland can maintain a fifth part more people than they now do, that is to say, nine millions of souls in all? For answer thereunto, I first say, that the said territories of England and the lowland of Scotland contain about thirty six millions of acres, that is four acres for every head man, woman, and child, but the United Provinces do not allow above one acre and half and England itself rescinding. Wales, hath but three acres to every head, according to the present state of tillage and husbandry. Now if we consider that England having but three acres to a head as aforesaid, doth so abound in victuals as that it maketh laws against the importation of cattle, flesh, and fish from abroad, and that the draining of fens, improving of forests, enclosing of commons, sowing of St. Foyne and clover grass, be grumbled against by landlords, as the way to depress their price of victuals, then it plainly follows, that less than three acres improved as it may be, will serve the turn, and kins that four will suffice abundantly. I could here set down the very number of acres, that would bear bread and drink, corn, together with flesh, butter, and cheese, sufficient to victual nine millions of persons, as they are victualled in ships, and regular families, but shall only say in general, that twelve millions of acres viz of thirty-six millions, will do it, supposing that roots, fruits, fowl, and fish, and their ordinary profit of lead, tin, iron mines, and woods, would piece up any defect, that may be feared. As to the second, I say, that the land and housing in Ireland, and the highlands of Scotland, at the present market rates, are not worth thirteen millions of money. Nor would the actual charge of making the transplantation proposed amount to four millions more. So then there question will be whether the benefit expected from this transplantation will exceed seventeen millions? To which I say that the advantage will probably be near four times the last mentioned sum, or about sixty nine millions, three hundred thousand pounds. For if the rent of all England and Wales, and the lowlands of Scotland, be about nine millions per annum, and if the fifth part of the people be superadded, unto the present inhabitants of those countries, then the rent will amount unto ten millions eight thousand litres, and the number of years purchase, will rise from seventeen and half, to a fifth part more, which is twenty-one, so as the land which is now worth but nine millions per annum, at seventeen half years purchase, making one hundred and fifty-seven millions and half, will then be worth ten millions eight 
100,000 pounds, at 21 years purchase. Viz. 226 millions, and 800 thousand pounds, that is, 69 millions, and 3 hundred thousand pounds more than it was before. And if any prince willing to enlarge his territories, will give anything more than six half millions or half the present value for the said relinquished land, which are estimated to be worth 13 millions, then the whole profit will be above 75 millions, and 800 600 liters. Above four times the loss, as the same was above computed. But if any man shall object, that it will be dangerous unto England, that Ireland should be in the hands of any other nation, I answer in short, that that nation, whoever shall purchase it, being divided by means of the said purchase, shall not be more able to annoy England, than now in its united condition. Nor is Ireland nearer England, than France and Flanders. Now if any man shall desire a more clear explanation, how, and by what means, the rents of lands shall rise by, this closer cohabitation of people above described, I answer, that the advantage will arise in transplanting about eighteen hundred thousand people, from the poor and miserable trade of husbandry, to more beneficial handicrafts, for when the superaddition is made, a very little addition of husbandry to the same lands will produce a fifth part more of food, and consequently the additional hands, earning forties per annum, as they may very well do, nay to eight litres per annum. At some other trade, the superlucration will be above three millions and six hundred thousand pounds per annum, which at twenty years purchase is seventy millions more. Over, as the inhabitants of cities and towns spend more commodities, and make greater consumptions, than those who live in wild thin peopled countries, so when England shall be thicker peopled, in the manner before described, there very same people shall then spend more, than when they lived more sordidly and inurbanely, and further asunder, and more out of the sight, observation, and emulation of each other, every man desiring to put on better apparel when he appears in company, than when he has no occasion to be seen. I further add, that the charge of the government, civil, military, and ecclesiastical, would be more cheap, safe, and effectual in this condition of closer cohabitation than other. Wise, as not only reason, but the example of the united provinces doth demonstrate. But to let this whole digression pass for a mere dream, I suppose twill serve to prove, that in case the king of England's territories, should be a little less than those of the king of France, that for as much as neither of them are overpeopled, that the difference is not material to the question in hand, wherefore supposing the king of France's advantages, to be little or nothing in this point of territory, we come next to examine and compare, the number of subjects which each of these monarchs doth govern. The book called The State of France, maketh that king dom to consist of twenty-seven thousand parishes, and another book written by a substantial author, who professedly inquires into the state of the church and churchmen of France, sets it down as an extraordinary case, that a parish in France should have six hundred souls, wherefore I suppose that the paid author, who hath so well examined the matter, is not of opinion that every parish, one with another, hath above five hundred, by which reckoning there whole people of France, are about thirteen millions and a half, now the people of England, Scotland, and Ireland, with the Slans adjoining by computation from the numbers of parishes, which commonly have more people in Protestant 
churches, than in popish countries, as also from the half. Money, poll money, and excise, do amount to about nine millions and half. There are in New England, about 16,000 men mustered. In arms, about 24,000 able to bear arms, and consequently, about 50,000 in all, and I see no reason why in all this. And the other plantations of Asia, Africa, and America, there should not be half a million in all, but this last I leave to every man's conjecture, and consequently, I suppose, that there King of England hath about ten millions of subjects, Ubivis, Terraram or Bice, and the King of France about thirteen and a half as aforesaid. Although it be very material to know the number of subjects belonging to each prince, yet when the question is concerning their wealth and strength, it is also material to examine how many of them do get more than they spend, and how many less, in order whereunto it is to be considered, that in the king of England's dominions, there are not twenty thousand churchmen, but in France, as the aforementioned author of theirs doth aver, who sets down the particular number of each religious order, there are about two hundred and seventy thousand, viz. 250,000. More than we think unnecessary, that is to say, 250,000 withdrawn out of the world. Now the said number of adult and able bodied persons are equivalent to about double the same number of the promise. Chaos mass of mankind. And the same author says that the same religious persons do spend one with another about 18 d per diem, which is triple even to what a laboring man requires. Wherefore the said 250,000 churchmen, living as they do, makes the king of France's 13 millions and a half, to be less than 13, now. If 10 men can defend themselves as well in islands, as 13 can upon the continent, then the said 10 being not concerned to increase their territory by the invasion of others, are as effectual as the 13 in point of strength. Also, wherefore that there are more superlucrators in their English, than the French dominions, we say as followeth. The be in England, Scotland, Ireland, and the kings. Other territories above 40,000 seamen in France. Not above a quarter so many, but one seaman earneth as much as three common husbandmen, wherefore this difference in seamen, addeth to the account of the King of England's subjects, is an advantage equivalent to sixty thousand husbandmen. There are in England, Scotland, and Ireland, and all are there. The King of England's territories six hundred thousand ton of shipping, worth about four millions and a half of money. And the annual charge of maintaining the shipping of England, by new buildings and reparations, is about one third part of their same sum, which is the wages of one hundred and fifty thousand husbandmen, but is not the wages of above part of so many artisans as are employed, upon shipping of all sorts, viz. shipwrights, Calkers, joiners, carvers, painters, block makers, rope makers, mast makers, smiths of several sorts, flag makers, compass makers, brewers, bakers, and all other sort of victuallers, all sorts of tradesmen relating to guns and gunners' stores, wherefore the being four times more of these artisans in England, and see, than in France, they further add to the account of the King of England's subjects. The equivalent of eighty thousand husbandmen more. The sea line of England, Scotland, and Ireland, and their adjacent islands, is about three thousand eight hundred miles, according to which length, and the whole content of acres 
the said land would be an oblong, or parallelogram. Figure of 3,800 miles long, and about 24 miles broad, and consequently, every part of England, Scotland, and Ireland, is one with another. But 12 miles from the sea, whereas France containing but about 1,000 miles of sea line, is by the like method or computation, about 65 miles from there. Seaside, and considering the paucity of ports, in comparison of what are in the King of England's dominions, as good as 70 miles distant from a port, upon which grounds it is clear, that England can be supplied, with all gross and bulk commodities of foreign growth and manufacture, at far cheaper rates than France can be, viz., at about 4s percent cheaper, the land carriage for the difference of the distance between England and France from a port, being so much or near thereabouts. Now to what advantage this conveniency? Amount F, upon the importation and exportation of bulk commodities, cannot be less than the labor of one million of people, and C, meaning by bulk commodities all sorts of timber, plank, and staves for cask, all iron, lead, stones, bricks, and tiles for building, all corn, salt, and drinks, all flesh and fish, and indeed all other commodities, wherein the gain and loss of fours percent is considerable, where note that the like wines are sold in the inner parts of France for four or five pound a ton, which near the ports yield seven one. Moreover upon this principle, the decay of timber in England is no very formidable thing, as the rebuilding of London, and of the ships wasted by the Dutch war do clearly manifest. Nor can there be any want of corn, or other necessary pro visions in England, unless the weather hath been universally unseasonable for the growth of the same, which seldom or never happens, for the same causes which make dearth in one place, do often cause plenty in another, wet weather, being propitious to highlands, which drowneth the low. It is observed that the poor of France, have generally less wages than in England, and yet their victuals are generally dearer there, which being so, there may be more superlucration in England than in France. Lastly, I offer it to the consideration of all those, who have travelled through England and France, whether they're plebans of England, for they constitute the bulk of any nation, do not spend a sixth part more than the plebans of France, and if so, it is necessary that they must first get it, and consequently the ten millions of the king of England's subjects, are equivalent to twelve of the king of France, and upon the whole matter, to the thirteen millions, at which the French nation was estimated. It will here be objected, that the splendor and magnify senses of the king of France, appearing greater than those of England, that the wealth of France must be proportionably greater, than that of England, but that doth not follow, for, as much as the apparent greatness of the king, doth depend, upon the quota powers of the people's wealth which he levieth, from them, for supposing of the people to be equally rich, if one of the sovereigns levy a fifth part, and another a fifteenth, the one seems actually thrice as rich as the other, whereas potentially, they are but equal. Having thus discoursed of the territory, people, super lucration, and defensibleness of both dominions, and in some measure of their trade, so far as we had occasion to mention ships, shipping, and nearness to ports, we come next to enlarge a little further upon the trade of each. Some have estimated that there are not above three hundred millions of people in the whole world. Whether that be so or no, is not very material to be known.
but I have fair grounds to conjecture, and would be glad to know it more certainly, that there are not above eighty millions with whom the English and Dutch have commerce, no Europeans that I know of, trading directly nor indirectly where they do not, so as the whole commercial world, or world of trade, consisteth of about eighty millions of souls. As aforesaid dot and I further estimate, that the value of all commodities, yearly exchanged amongst them, doth not exceed the value of forty-five millions, now the wealth of every nation, consisting chiefly, in the share which they have in the foreign trade with the whole commercial world, rather than in their domestic trade, of ordinary meat, drink, and clothes, and sea, which bringing in little gold, silver, jewels, and other universal wealth, we are to consider, whether the subjects of the King of England, head for head, have not a greater share, than those of France. To which purpose it hath been considered, that their manufactures of wool, yearly exported out of England, into several parts of the world, viz. all sorts of cloth, serges, stuffs, cottons, bays, says, prize, perpetuous, as also stockings, caps, rugs, and sea, exported out of England, Scot land, and Oakland, do amount unto five millions per annum. The value of lead, tin, and coals, to be five hundred thousand pounds. The value of all clothes, household stuff and sea, carried into America, two hundred thousand pounds. The value of silver, and cold, taken from the Spaniards, sixty thousand pounds. The value of sugar, indigo, tobacco, cotton, and cacao. Draw out from the southward parts of America six hundred thousand pounds. The value of the fish, pipes, staves, masts, bever, and sea. Brought from New England and the northern parts of America, two hundred thousand pounds. The value of the wool, butter, hides, tallow, beef. Herring, pitchers, and salmon, exported out of Ireland. Eight hundred thousand pounds. The value of the coals, salt, linen, yarn, herrings, pilas, salmon, linen cloth, and yarn, brought out of Scotland and Ireland five million and one. The value of saltpetre, pepper, clicos, diamonds, drugs, and silks brought out of the East Indies, above what was spent in England, eight hundred thousand pounds. The value of the slaves, brought out of Africa, to serve in our American plantations twenty thousand pounds, which, with the freight of English shipping, trading into foreign parts, being above a million and a half makes in all ten millions one hundred and eighty thousand pounds which computation is sufficiently justified by the customs of the three kingdoms, whose intrinsic value are thought to be near a million per annum, viz. six hundred thousand pounds, payable to the king, one hundred thousand pounds, for the charges of collecting, and c. two hundred thousand pounds, smuggled by the merchants, and one hundred thousand pounds gained by the farmers, according to common opinion, and men's sayings, and this agrees also with that proportion, or part of the whole trade of the world, which I have estimated the subjects of the King of England to be possessed of, viz., of about ten of forty-five millions, but the value of the French commodities, brought into England, notwithstanding some current estimates, are not above one million two hundred thousand pounds per annum. And the value of all the export into all the world besides, not above three or four times as much, which computation also agreeth well enough, with the account we have of the 
customs of France, so is France not exporting above there. Value of what England doth, and for that all the commodities of France, except wines, brandy, paper, and the first patterns, and fashions for clothes, and furniture, of which France is. The mint, are imitable by the English, and having with all more people than England, it follows that the people of England, and e have head for head, thrice as much foreign trade as the people of France, and about two parts of nine of the trade of the whole commercial world, and about two parts in seven of all the shipping, not with standing all which it is not to be denied, that the king and some great men of France, appear more rich and splendid than those of the like quality in England, all which arises rather from the nature of their government, than from their intrinsic and natural causes of wealth and power. Chap. V. That the impediments of England's greatness, are but contingent and removable. The first impediment of England's greatness is, that there territories thereunto belonging, are too far asunder, and divided by the sea into many several islands and countries, and I may say, into so many kingdoms, and several govern, ments, viz., the be three distinct legislative powers in England, Scotland, and Ireland, the which instead of uniting together, do often cross one another's interest, putting bars and impediments upon one another's trades, not only as if they were foreigners to each other, but sometimes as enemies. 2. The islands of Jersey and Guernsey, and the Isle of Man, are under Juridians different from those, either of England, Scotland, or Ireland. 3. The government of New England, both civil and ecclesiastical, doth so differ from that of his majesty's are there dominions, that tis hard to say what may be the consequence of it. And the government of the other plantations, doth also differ very much from any of the rest, although there be not naturally substantial reasons from the situation, trade, and condition of the people, why there should be such differences from all which it comes to pass that small divided remote governments being seldom able to defend themselves. The burthen of protecting of them all must lie upon the chief kingdom England, and so all the smaller kingdoms and dominions, instead of being additions are really diminutions. But the same is remedied by making two such grand councils as may equally represent the whole empire, one to be chosen by the king, the other by the people. The wealth of a king is threefold, one is the wealth of his subjects, there. Second is the quota pars of his subjects' wealth, given him. For the public defense, honor, and ornament of the people. And to manage such undertaking for the common good, as no one or a few private men, are sufficient for. The third sort are the quota, of the last mentioned quota, pars, which the king may dispose of, as his own personal inclination, and discretion shall direct him, without account. Now it is most manifest, that the aforementioned distances, and differences, of kingdoms, and jurisdictions, are great impediments to all the said several sorts of wealth, as may be seen in the following particulars. First in case of war. With foreign nations, England commonly beareth the whole burthen, and charge, whereby many in England are utterly undone. Secondly, England sometimes prohibiting the commo ditties of Ireland, and Scotland, as of late it did the cattle flesh, and fish, of Ireland, did not only make food, and consequently labor, dearer in England, but also hath forced the people of Ireland, to fetch those commodities from France, 
Holland, and other places, which before was sold them from England, to the great prejudice of both nations. Thirdly, it occasions an unnecessary trouble, and charge. In collecting of customs, upon commodities passing between the several nations. Fourthly, it is a damage to our Barbados, and other American trades, that the goods which might pass thence immediately to several parts of the world, and to be sold at moderate rates, must first come into England, and there pay duties, and afterwards, if at all, pass into those countries, whither they might have gone immediately. Fifthly, the islands of Jersey and Guernsey, are protected. At the charge of England, nevertheless the labour, and industry, of that people, which is very great, redounds. Most to the profit of the French. Sixthly, in New England, there are vast numbers of able bodied Englishmen, employed chiefly in husbandry, and in the meanest part of it, which is breeding of cattle, whereas Ireland would have contained all those persons, and at worst, would have afforded them lands on better terms, than they have them in America, if not some other better trade with all than now they can have. Seventhly, the inhabitants of the other plantations, although they do indeed plant commodities, which will not grow so well in England, yet grasping at more land, than will suffice to produce the said exotics in a sufficient quantity to serve the whole world, they do therein but distract, and confound, the effect of their own endeavours. Eighthly, there is no doubt that the same people, far and wide dispersed, must spend more upon their government, and protection, than the same living compactly, and when they have no occasion to depend upon the wind, weather, and all the accidents of the sea. A second impediment to the greatness of England, is the different understanding of several material points, viz. of the king's prerogative, privileges of parliament, the obscure differences between law and equity, as also between civil and ecclesiastical jurisdictions, doubts whether the king Dom of England hath power over the kingdom of Ireland. Besides the wonderful paradox, that Englishmen, lawfully sent to suppress rebellions in Ireland, should after having effected the same, be as it were, disfranchised, and lose that interest in the legislative power, which they had in England, and pay customs as foreigners for all they spend in ire, land, whither they were sent, for the honour and benefit of England. The third impediment is, that Ireland being a conquered country, and containing not the tenth part as many Irish natives, as there are English in both kingdoms, that natural and firm union is not made, between the two peoples, by transplantations, and proportionable mixture, so as there may be but a tenth part, of the Irish in Ireland, and there same proportion in England, whereby the necessity of maintaining an army in Ireland, at the expense of a quarter of all the rents of that kingdom may be taken away. The fourth impediment is, that taxes in England are not levied upon the expense, but upon the whole estate, not upon lands, stock, and labour, but chiefly upon land alone, and that not by any equal and indifferent standard, but the casual predominancy of parties and factions, and moreover that these taxes are not levied with the least trouble and charge, but let out to farmers, who also let them from one to another without explicit knowledge of what they do, but so as in conclusion, the poor people pay twice as much as the king receives. The fifth impediment is the inequality of shires, dioceses, parishes, church livings, and other precincts, as also their representation of the people in parliament, all which do 
hinder the operations of authority in the same manner, as a wheel irregularly made, and eccentrically hung, neither moves so easily, nor performs its work so truly, as if there same were duly framed and poised. Sixthly, whether it be an impediment, that the power of making war, and raising money be not in the same hand. Much may be said, but I leave it to those, who may more properly meddle with fundamental laws. None of these impediments are natural, but did arise as the irregularity of buildings do, by being built, part at one time, and part at another, and by the changing of the state of things, from what they were at the respective times, when the practices we complain of, were first admitted, and perhaps are but the warpings of time, from the rectitude of the first institution. As these impediments are contingent, so they are also removable, for may not the land of superfluous territories be sold, and the people with their movables brought away? May not the English in the America plantations, who plant tobacco, sugar, and sea, compute what land will serve their turn, and then contract their habitations to that proportion, both for quantity and quality, as for the people of New England. I can but wish they were transplanted into Old England, or Ireland, according to proposals of their own, made within this twenty years, although they were allowed more liberty of conscience, than they allow one another. May not the three kingdoms be united into one, and equally represented in Parliament? Might not the several species of the king's subjects, be equally mixed in their habitations, might not the parishes, and other precincts be better equalized? Might not jurisdictions, and pretenses of power, be determined and ascertained? Might not the taxes be equally applauded, and directly applied to their ultimate use? Might not dissenters in religion be indulged, they paying a competent force to keep the public peace? I humbly venture to say, all these things may be done, if it be so thought fit by the sovereign power, because the like hath often been done already, at several places and times. Chap. Vi. That the power and wealth of England hath increased this last forty years. It is not much to be doubted, but that the territories under the king's dominions have increased, for as much as New England, Virginia, Barbados, and Jamaica. Tangier, and Bumb, have since that time, been either added to his majesty's territories, or improved from a desert condition, to abound with people, buildings, shipping, and the production of many useful commodities, and as for the land of England, Scotland, and Ireland, as it is not less in quantity than it was forty years since. So it is manifest that by reason of the draining of fens, watering of dry grounds, improving of forests and commons, making of heat he and barren grounds, to bear St. Foyne and clover grass, meliorating and multiplying several sorts of fruits and garden stuff, making some rivers navigable, and see, I say it is manifest that the land in its present condition, is able to bear more provision, and commodities, than it was forty years ago. Secondly, although the people in England, Scotland, and Ireland, which have extraordinarily perished by the plague, and sword, within this last forty years, do amount to about three hundred thousand, above what have died in the ordinary way, yet the ordinary increase by generation of ten millions, which doubles in two hundred years, as hath been shown by the observators upon the bills of mortality, may in forty years, which is a fifth part of the same time, have increased part of the whole number, or two millions.
where note. By the way, that the accession of Negroes to the American plantations, being all men of great labor and little ex pence, is not inconsiderable, besides it is hoped that new England, where few or no women are barren, and most have many children, and where people live long, and healthfully, hath produced an increase of as many people, as were destroyed in the late tumults in Ireland. As for housing, the streets of London itself speaks it, I conceive it is double in value in that city, to what it was forty years since, and for housing in the country, they have increased, at Newcastle, Yarmouth, Norwich, Exeter, Ports, Mouth, Cowes, Dublin, Kingsay Isle, Londonderry, and Coleraine. In Ireland, far beyond the proportion of what I can learn, to have been dilapidated in other places. For in Ireland where the ruin was greatest, the housing, taking all together, is now more valuable than forty years ago, nor is this to be doubted, since housing is now more splendid, than in those days, and the number of dwellers is increased, by near part, as in the last paragraph is set forth. As for shipping, His Majesty's Navy is now triple, or quadruple, to what it was forty years since, and before the sovereign was built, the shipping trading to Newcastle, which are now about eighty thousand tons, could not be then above a quarter of that quantity, first, because the city of London is doubled, two, because the use of coals is also at least doubled, because they were heretofore seldom used in chambers, as now they are, nor were there so many bricks burned with them as of late, nor did the country on both sides the Thames make use of them as now. Besides, there are employed in the Guinea and American trade, above 40,000 ton of shipping per annum, which trade in those days was inconsiderable. The quantity in wines imported was not near so much as now, and to be short, the customs upon imported and exported commodities did not then yield a third part of the present value, which shows that not only shipping, but trade itself hath increased somewhat near that proportion. As to money, the interest thereof was within this fifty years, at ten litres per cent. Forty years ago, at eighty-one, and now at six litres. No thanks to any laws which have been made to that purpose, for as much as those who can give good security, may now have it at less, but the natural fall of interest, is the effect of the increase of money. Moreover if rented lands, and houses, have increased, and if trade hath increased also, it is certain that money, which payeth those rents, and driveth on trade, must have increased also. Lastly, I leave it to the consideration of all observers, whether the number and splendor of coaches, equipage, and household furniture, hath not increased, since that time, too. Say nothing of the postage of letters, which have increased from one to twenty, which argues the increase of business and negotiation. I might add that His Majesty's revenue is near tripled, and therefore the means to pay and bear there. Same, have increased also. Chap. 7. That one tenth part of the whole expense of the King of England's subjects is sufficient to maintain ten thousand foot, forty thousand horse, and forty thousand men at sea, and defray all other charges of the government. Both ordinary and extraordinary, if the same were regularly taxed, and raised. To clear this point, we are to find out, what is the middle expense of each head in the king's dominions, between the highest and the lowest, to which I say it is not probably less than the expense of a laborer, who earneth about eight d. 
a day, for the wages of such a man is fours, per week without victuals or twos. With it, wherefore the value of his victuals is twos, per week, or fifty-one, fours, per annum. Now the value of clothes cannot be less than the wages given to the poorest maid servant in the country, which is thirties, per annum, nor can the charge of all other necessaries be less than sixes, per annum more, wherefore the whole charge is seven litres. It is not likely that this discourse will fall into the hands of any that live at seven litres per annum, and therefore such will wonder at this supposition, but if they consider how much the number of the poor, and their children, is greater than that of the rich, although the personal expense of some rich men, should be twenty times more than that of a laborer, yet the expense of the laborer above mentioned, may well enough stand for the standard of the expense, of the whole mass of mankind. Now if the expense of each man, one with another, be seven liters per annum, and if the number of the king's subjects, be ten millions, then the tenth part of the whole expense, will be seven millions, but about five millions, or a very little more, will amount to one year's pay for one hundred thousand foot, forty thousand horse, and forty thousand men at sea, winter and summer, which can rarely be necessary, and the ordinary charge of the government, in times of deep and serene peace, was not six hundred thousand one per annum. Where a people thrive, there the income is greater than the expense, and consequently the tenth part of the expense is not a tenth part of the income, now for men to pay a tenth of their expense, in a time of the greatest exigency, for such it must be when so great forces are requisite, can be no hardship, much less a deplorable condition, for to bear the tenth part, a man needs spend but a twentieth part less, and labor a twentieth part more, or half an hour per dm. Extraordinary, both which within common experience are very tolerable, there being very few in England, who do not eat by a twentieth part more than does them good, and what misery were it, instead of wearing cloth of twenties, per yard, too, be contented with that of nineteens. Few men having skill enough to discern the difference. Memorandum, that all this while I suppose, that all of these ten millions of people, are obedient to their sovereign, and within the reach of his power, for as things are other wise, so the calculation must be varied. Chap. 8. That there are spare hands enough among the king of England's subjects, to earn two millions per annum. More than they now do, and that there are also employ ments, ready, proper, and sufficient, for that purpose. To prove this point we must inquire, how much all there People could earn, if they were disposed, or necessitated, to labor, and had work whereupon to employ themselves. And compare that sum, with that of the total expense, above mentioned, deducting the rents, and profits of their land, and stock, which properly speaking, saveth so much labor. Now the proceed of the said lands, and stock in the countries, is about three parts of seven, of the whole expense, so as where the expense is seventy millions, there rent of the land, and the profit of all the personal estate interest of money, and c, must be about thirty millions, and consequently, the value of the labor forty millions, that is four liters per head. But it is to be noted, that about a quarter of the mass of mankind, are children, males, and females, under seven years old, 
from whom little labor is to be expected. It is also to be noted, that about another tenth part of the whole people, are such as by reason of their great estates, titles, dignities, offices, and professions, are exempt from that kind of labor we now speak of, their business being, or ought to be, to govern, regulate, and direct, the labors, and actions, of others. So that of ten millions, there may be about six millions and a an half, which, if need require, might actually labor, and of these some might earn threes per week, some five s, and some sevens. That is all of them might turn fives per week at a medium one with another, or at least ten liters per annum, allowing for sickness, and other accidents, whereby the whole might turn sixty-five millions per annum, that is, twenty-five more than the expense. The author of the State of England, says that the children of Norwich, between six and sixteen years old, to earn one thousand two hundred litres per annum, more than they spend. Now for as much as the people of Norwich, are a three hundredth part of all the people of England, as appears by the accounts of the hearth money, and about a five hundredth part, of all the king's subjects throughout the world, it follows that all his Majesty's subjects, between six and sixteen years old, might earn five millions per annum more than they spend. Again, for as much as the number of people, above sixteen years old, are double the number, of those between six and sixteen, and that each of the men can earn double to each of the children, it is plain that if the men and children every where did do as they do in Norwich, they might earn twenty five millions per annum more than they spend, which estimate, grounded upon matter of fact and experience, agrees with the former. Although as hath been proved, the people of England do thrive, and that it is possible they might superlucrate twenty five millions per annum, yet it is manifest that they do not nor twenty-three, which is less by the two millions herein, meant, for if they did superlucrate twenty-three millions, then in about five or six years' time, the whole stock, and personal estate of the nation would be doubled, which I wish were true, but find no manner of reason to believe. Wherefore if they can superlucrate twenty-five, but do not actually superlucrate twenty-three, nor twenty, nor ten, nor perhaps five, I have then proved what was propounded, viz. that there are spare hands among the king's subjects, to earn two millions more than they do. But to speak a little more particularly concerning this matter, it is to be noted that since the fire of London, there was earned in four years by tradesmen, relating to building only, the sum of four millions, viz. one million per annum, without lessening any other sort of work, labor, or manufacture, which was usually done in any other four years before the said occasion, but if the tradesmen relating to building only, and such of them only as wrought in and about London, could do one million worth of work extra. Ordinary, I think that from thence, and from what hath been said before, all the rest of the spare hands, might very well double the same, which is as much as was propounded. Now if there were spare hands to superlucrate millions of millions, they signify nothing unless there were employment for them, and may as well follow their pleasures, and speculations, as labor to no purpose. Therefore, the more material point is to prove that there is two millions worth of work to be done, which at present the king's subjects do neglect. For the proof of this, there needs little more to be done than to compute one how much money is paid by the king 
of England's subjects to foreigners for freights of shipping. 2. How much the Hollanders gain by their fishing trade? Practiced upon our seas. 3. What the value is of all the commodities imported into and spent in England, which might by diligence be produced and manufactured here? 2. Make short of this matter, upon perusal of the most orthon. Ticacumpts, relating to these several particulars, I affirm that the same amount hath to above five millions, whereas I propounded but two millions. For a further proof whereof Mr. Samuel Fortry in his ingenious discourse of trade, exhibits the particulars, where in it appears that the goods imported out of France only amount yearly to two millions six hundred thousand pounds. And I affirm that the wine, paper, cork, rosin, capers, and a few other commodities, which England cannot produce, do not amount to one fifth part of the said sum. From whence it follows that, if Mr. Fortry hath not erred, the two millions here mentioned may arise from France alone, and kins. Quently five or six millions, from all the three heads last above specified. Chap. 9. That there is money sufficient to drive the trade of the nation. Since His Majesty's happy restoration, it was thought fit to call in a new coin the money, which was made in the times of usurpation. Now it was observed by the general consent of cashiers, that the said money, being by frequent revolutions well mixed with old, was about a seventh part thereof, and that the said money being called in, was about eight hundred thousand litres, and consequently the whole five millions six hundred thousand pound, whereby it is probable that, some allow ants being given for hoarded money, the whole cash of England was then about six millions, which I conceive is sufficient to drive the trade of England, not doubting but the rest of His Majesty's dominions have the like means to do the same respectively. If there be six millions of souls in England, and that each spendeth seven litres per annum, then the whole expense is forty-two millions, or about eight hundred thousand pound per week. And consequently, if every man did pay his expense weekly, and that the money could circulate within the compass of a week, then less than one million would answer the ends proposed. But for as much as the rents of the lands in England, which are paid half yearly, are eight millions per annum, there must be four millions to pay them, and for as much as the rent of the housing of England, paid quarterly, are worth about four millions per annum, the needs, but one million to pay the said rents, where for six millions, being enough to make good the three sorts of circulations, above mentioned, I conceive what was proposed, is contently proved at least until something better be held forth. To the contrary. Chap. X. That the King of England's subjects, have stock competent, and convenient, to drive the trade of the whole commercial, world. Now for the further encouragement of trade, as we have, shown that there is money enough in England to manage, the affairs thereof, so we shall now offer to consideration, whether there be not a competent, and convenient stock to drive the trade of the whole commercial world. To which purpose it is to be remembered, that all the commodities yearly exported out of every part of the last mentioned world, may be bought for forty-five millions, and that their shipping employed in the same world, are not worth above fifteen millions more, and consequently, that sixty millions at most, would drive the whole trade above mentioned, without any trust at all.
but for as much as the growers of Como. Ditties, do commonly trust them to such merchants or factors. As are worth but such a part of the full value of their commodities, as may possibly be lost upon the sale of them. Whereas gain is rather to be expected, it follows that less than a stock of sixty millions, nay less than half of their same sum, is sufficient to drive the trade above mentioned. It being well known that any tradesman of good reputation, worth five hundred litres, will be trusted with above one thousand litres, worth of com. Commodities, wherefore less than thirty millions, will suffice for the said purpose, of which sum, the coin, shipping, and stock, already in trade, do at least make one half. And it hath been shown, how by the policy of a bank, any sum of money may be made equivalent in trade, unto near double of the same, by all which it seems, that even at present much is not wanting, to perform what is propounded. But suppose twenty millions or more were wanting, it is not improbable, that since the generality of gentlemen, and some noblemen, do put their younger sons to merchandise, they will see it reasonable, as they increase in the number of merchants, so to increase the magnitude of trade, and consequently to increase stock, which may effectually be done, by embanking twenty millions worth of land, not being above a sixth or seventh of the whole territory of England, that is to say, by making a fond of such value to be security for all commodities, bought and sold upon their account of that universal trade here mentioned, and thus it having appeared, that England having in it as much land, like Holland and Zealand, as the said two provinces do themselves contain, with abundance of other land, not inconvenient for trade, and that there are spare bands enough, to earn many millions of money, more than they now do, and that there is also employment to earn several millions, even from the consumption of England it self, it follows from thence, and from what hath been said in the last paragraph, about enlarging of stock, both of money and land, that it is not impossible, nay a very feasible matter, for the King of England's subjects, to gain the universal trade of the whole commercial world. Nor is it unseasonable to intimate this matter, for as much as the younger brothers, of the good families of England, cannot otherwise be provided for, so as to live according to their birth and breeding, for if the lands of England are worth eight millions per annum, then there be at a medium about ten thousand families, of about eight hundred litres per annum, in each of which, one with another, we may suppose there is a younger brother, whom less than two or three hundred litres per annum will not maintain suitable to his relations. Now I say that neither the offices at court, nor commands in our ordinary army and navy, nor church preferments, nor the usual gains by the profession of the law, and physic, nor their employments under noblemen, and prelates, will, all of them put together, furnish livelihoods of above three hundred litres per annum, to three thousand of the said ten thousand younger brothers, whereof it remains that trade alone must supply the rest, but if the said seven thousand gentlemen, be applied to trade, without increasing of trade, or if we hope to increase trade, without increasing of stock, which, for aught appears, is only to be done, by embanking a due proportion of lands, and money, we must necessarily be disappointed, where note, that selling of lands to foreigners, for gold and silver, would enlarge the stock of the kingdom. Whereas doing the same between one another, doth effect nothing. For he that turneth all his land into money, disposes himself for trade, 
and he that parteth with his money for land, doth the contrary, but to sell land to foreigners, increaseth both money and people, and kins. Quently trade? Wherefore it is to be thought, that when the laws denying strangers to purchase, and not permitting them to trade, without paying extraordinary duties, were made, that then, the public state of things, and interest of the nation, were far different from what they now are. Having handled these ten principal conclusions, I might go on with others, ad infinitum, but what hath been already said, I look upon as sufficient, for to show what I mean by political arithmetic, and to show the uses of knowing the true state of the people, land, stock, trade, and circuit too, that the king's subjects are not in so bad a condition as this. Contented men would make them. 3. To show the great effect of unity, industry, and obedience, in order to their common safety, and each man's particular happiness.